Cheer is a six-part Netflix documentary series following a, a cheerleading squad from a very small town in um, small town USA in Texas. I'm Rob Lacurie, senior editor here at Gold Derby, here with the creator, executive producer, and director of Cheer, Greg Whiteley. Greg, some of your previous work has focused on young people in various settings. Why did you want to spotlight cheerleading for this series? We were filming uh, our second season of Last Chance You, and we were in Scuba, Mississippi. Uh, the show was successful enough in its first season that we got renewed for a second season, and a field producer at the time, uh, Chelsea Arnell and I, we were scrambling, like, how can we film season two in a way that would be unique from season one? We just didn't want to simply retell uh, the same story. And so we started looking at, the, the focus was on the football team in season one. We thought, well, what well, you know, what else is there? There was a band that was of some prominence. And then uh, although these cheerleaders, they're there at every game. We should probably get to know them a little bit better. So we went to a cheer practice and we were surprised at how intense that cheer practice was. And we started asking these cheerleaders, you know, what, what uh, um, these stunts that we're seeing you're practicing here, how come we never see those on the sideline? And they go, oh, we would we would never do those on the sideline. These are stunts that we're, we're preserving for the end of the year competition at Daytona. And uh, I'd, I'd never heard of Daytona. And so I asked them to explain and they were describing that there is this one competition at the end of the year. And there was just something about that that started to seem like it could be the ingredients of a pretty great show. Yeah, like I, um don't know a lot about cheerleading. I, I think I've seen like Bring It On and that was probably the movie and that was probably the end of my knowledge. And so I thought, okay, I, I'm going to learn something about this. And what first got me, what I was really taken with was how the series so poignantly addresses how so many of these kids are from troubled upbringings. And it's like this cheerleading um, fraternity or whatever you want to call it was kind of like a lifeline for them and I'm just wondering was that one of the main angles that you really wanted to tackle and when did that occur to you when you were developing this? Well the first day that we were filming and this was true of, of the, the, the documentary series Last Chance You as well you show up and the first thing we're filming is a practice and there are 30 some odd cheerleaders that are on the team and you can't focus on all 30 of them. It just wouldn't be a very interesting show. You, you need to pick a small handful and, and, then, and then go deep in, 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 in three, four, five of them uh, in order to really tell a proper story. You only, you only have six hours. And so you need to, we, we've always took a degree of pride over the fact that we'll go deep um, with a character um, with one character rather than go, uh, you know, shallow with multiple characters. Um, so in going deep in these characters, there was a common thread in that each of them appeared to be people that had, for one reason or another, something in their life that they were wrestling with and cheer appeared to be an antidote of, of sorts. That There was this thing that they were using to sort of cope with this thing that had nothing to do with cheerleading. Um, an example would be Morgan, who is this girl who came from uh, Colorado and then Wyoming. And because of some uh, trouble in her family, she wound up living on her own for a short period of time uh, at as 14 years old in a trailer by herself waking up, going to high school, trying to blend in, trying to conceal the fact that she was living on her own. Um, and uh, this kind of uh, loneliness and this sort of hunger for a family, um, she seemed to fill with this Navarro cheer team, you know, in addition to being just uh, bright and uh, relatively homeless for a short period of time in her in her life. She was also blessed with an unbelievable physical ability to uh, move her body through space and also just was physically fearless. Um, and so I think just in being good storytellers, we wanted to get to know her better. What is it? Why are you so obsessed with this activity? And they're all obsessed. I mean, to, to even make the cheer team at Navarro, you have to be a certain level of obsession. 
uh, you, you had to have put in hours and hours and hours of uh, developing a specific type of skill that seems to have no application outside of the world of cheer. And so you really have to ask yourself, well, why is this person doing it? And in the case of each of the five people that we chose to focus on, they all had very interesting answers as to why that was true. Yeah, and that's exactly one of the other things I took away from this, and that is this show really emphasizes the, the universal theme about how teams excel and function best when their members trust each other and also when there's commitment. Um, that could be for any activity or any profession, but it really manifests itself so clearly in the physicality of what they're doing. People are literally being thrown up into the air, and if you're not there to catch them, they will die. <laughs> like, that's pretty much what I took out of this activity. So talk us through that aspect of it because it, it's pretty apparent from like the first 10 minutes of watching the first episode that that is a really big part of what this whole industry seems to be based on yeah if you're if you're um editing a magazine or if you're editing a website anything that requires a, a level of collaboration if you're making a film it, it requires a type of give and take and and a trust that you very quickly have to arrive at if you don't know each other very well. Otherwise, it, that collaboration is going to break down and the work is going to suffer. Uh, in the case of a cheer routine, um, if there isn't that cohesion, that level of trust, um, people are going to get hurt. Not, not only will the routine not be very good, but, but people are going to physically put, be putting their lives in danger uh, by virtue of the fact that someone isn't there to catch someone after they've fallen 25 feet in the air. Yeah, and as someone who's not American, I was also really fascinated about how uniquely American cheerleading appears to be. Um, I'm not aware of any other cultures or other um, countries, perhaps maybe apart from Canada, where this is such an important part of high school and college life. Why do you think that is? I, I think I'm blind. I would love for somebody from Sydney, Australia to tell me <laughs> what it is that they find that's uniquely American, because I agree with you. I think it is, but I'm not sure I could tick off all the reasons why yeah. uh, it's something. Tell me, what, what do you think it is that when you see it, you go, oh, that is so American. Yeah, look, I don't know. I've got to, I've, I was really thinking about it because we have other countries have cheap cheerleaders, I suppose, but not like this. Like, these people are athletes. They are so talented. It's like I was watching the Olympics, and they take it really yeah. seriously. And me, I think something about Americans that I've learned over my life, because I know so many Americans, is that Americans are so proud of um, achieving things and being really good at something, and perhaps it could be that part of the American psyche, which is, striving to do something really really great in a particular field i don't know like i can't really put my finger on it what do you i mean any other thoughts i mean you you, what, what, you, you may you be hitting it yeah I, maybe. I, I i think part of what is fun about this show is you're taking an activity that uh has largely i think been um marginalized or ignored or it, it, it's something you know that cheerleaders exist but they occupy a certain space in terms of um, the, the quintessential cheerleader is just seen as somebody kind of light. They're involved in activity, an activity that doesn't doesn't have a lot of substance. It doesn't require a lot of them. They're just very supportive. They're they're usually attractive, and that's pretty much all you know about cheerleading. I think for a long time, some of that may have been true, and, and maybe this is what's quintessentially American: is that somebody like Monica Aldama comes along and she. Um, because of some twists and turns in her life, she finds herself uh, with a business degree from UT and coaching uh, this cheer squad in a rural East Texas, uh, in Corsicana, Texas. And I think she just makes this decision like, well, all right, if this is who I am and this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to be the greatest in the world at it. And she yeah. was part of a number of people uh, who in, you know, let's take, I guess it would be the mid nineties or early two thousands that took the sport or the activity of cheerleading and turned it into a full fledged sport. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've been around a lot. I've yeah. filmed a lot of sports. The toughest athletes I've ever filmed are those kids at Navarro. And it's not something I was prepared for prior to filming this show. 
Yeah. And I love that this to me was also an underdog tale. And so many of us love to watch that story. Um, and it reminded me of some of your other work. Um, you know, you resolved, for example, last chance, you, you, you do seem to focus a lot on younger people in competitive fields, striving to win something or to achieve something like why in your career have you always seemed to focus on that kind of sporting or competitive thing for younger people? What is it about that that really drives you? My wife says it's because I was a second string quarterback in high school. <laughs> and, and so I, my, my sympathies are always with the person that doesn't make Matt or is on the verge of not making Matt or is the person that is uh, backing up somebody who is great um yeah i don't know that that may that may have something to do with it but i don't think i'm unique and i think those stories are um lots of people are interested in those stories i think i think it's because every single human being um even people who have achieved greatness in their lives have at one point or another felt uh like they are on the outside looking in or that they are an underdog in one way or another and i think we will always find those stories inspiring. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what these <clears throat> that's what these kids um, kind of taught me. Did you did you learn anything about yourself as a, a director, producer, creator on this particular project that perhaps you you weren't expecting from all of your other work? Well, everything I, I, I've worked on, I always come out the other end ha having learned a ton. Um, and largely it's due to uh, the people that I work with um, and uh, the people that we're filming. Uh, a perfect example is I, I watched uh, Monica Aldama and the, the seriousness with which she takes her job day in and day out, the level of detail um, was inspiring to me. I, 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 I was reminded that the great people that I've I've been privileged to come in contact with in my life seem to have that in common, that they they are um, very hardworking and and very detail oriented. Yeah, there's always this one question that I have for um, directors in documentary the documentary space, and that's you, you use a lot of archival footage. There's a lot of talking heads. That's the stuff that you expect. But it's the stuff where you're filming um, like real life interactions. And I always wonder, how do you get that authenticity out of people interacting when they know there are cameras and there's a camera crew around them? Like There are moments where it is so raw and authentic and doesn't feel staged. And that must be quite challenging to get that right. It's it's not the cameras that are going to get in your way of capturing authentic moments. It's a belief on the part of your main subject that or a concern that that you don't have their best interests at heart. And it's when when they are suspicious of your motives, their guard is up or they'll 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 perform on camera. They'll they'll give you what you think you want, but it isn't who they really are because they're guarding who they really are, and they're waiting for somebody to come along who they trust before they're gonna show who they really are. I feel like uh, being good at this job, and if, and if good at the job is being judged by how, how authentic are these moments that you're capturing? How often are you getting people to uh, trust you to a degree to really share who they are? Uh, I time and again, I'm having to really work on being the kind of person that's worthy of that trust. Uh, and uh, to the degree that I am successful in doing it is to the degree we, we get those moments. To the degree that I fall short, um, there are missed moments. And, and, and every project I've worked on, there's been a little of both. And, and, and all you can do, I think, as a filmmaker is just Keep trying, keep trying to just, for lack of a better phrase, just try to be a better person. Yeah, and that um, reminds me, um, you go from working with kids and younger people in certain settings, and then you did the Mitt documentary. He's a guy who was reviled by the left 
for years and years and is now kind of like become an unlikely hero in the Trump era. When you put this together and then um, it premiered, um, I was amazed at how much access you had to this guy and to his inner circle. What was that like to work alongside someone like Mitt Romney? That's one of the great honors of my professional life. I, I, uh, I had met him the first day I began filming and um, I immediately became, uh, I was struck by the great disparity that existed between the myth that I was seeing day to day as I was following him around through two presidential campaigns and the myth that I was seeing being reported on TV. Uh, and I'm not I'm not blaming the media. I think that some of it lies on the feet of campaign managers uh, and, and perhaps even, uh, you know, other people. You get this notion. And I think in years past, there is a sense anytime you're going on camera, you want to immediately scrub yourself clean of anything that might embarrass you. Uh, and, and the problem in doing that is you end up throwing out the, the very best parts of you as well or that can happen. And I just, because Mitt and I, we, we forged a connection and he chose to trust me and, and I was allowed in and to film some of these smaller moments that, that end up looming large because they were, they happened to be happening during a presidential campaign. I feel like there was a portrait that began to emerge that was who he really is. And in this particular instance, it ended up being an incredibly impressive person. I, I think he is a truly impressive person. I, I have no doubt that if I was filming Barack Obama, who is who he was racing against at the time, I, I, I'm sure that a, a similar portrait would have emerged, you know, a different human being, but also impressive. We, we tend to do this, and it's especially true with presidential politics. I think it's also true of celebrities. We, we forget that they're real people. And so we just start treating them as if there are these two dimensional entities that you can say anything you want to about them. You don't trust anything that comes out of their mouth. It's so, it was so weird to me. There was a whole plane full of very bright, very intelligent, very experienced political writers who were tasked with covering Mitt Romney. And I just note, I just noticed time and time again, there, there was not a full portrait that was ever emerging in the articles that, that I was reading. Uh, and I think partly that's due to the campaign who felt very strongly, you've got to keep your campaign, you've got to keep a candidate on message. I think this is true of any subject I've ever filmed. It was especially true of Mitt that it, the moment we could pierce that and show who he really was, it's, it's invariably you're going to surprise people with the portrait that emerges. I think the same is true with cheerleading. There is, there are certain tropes, there are certain stereotypes of an American cheerleader. And if you just will wait those moments out, because those, those moments will be there. There were plenty of opportunities in which you could have really put forward a very quintessential portrait of an American cheerleader. But if you'll look for the thing that's deeper and just beyond that, this more authentic portrait will emerge. Uh, it was true for Mitt, and it was true for those cheerleaders in the Vero as well. Yeah, well, Greg, I'm really grateful that you were able to dig a bit deeper into uh, the world of cheerleading. I certainly learned a lot, and um, we thank you very much for your time today and, and talking us through some of those elements. Well, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Please, good luck in Sydney. Stay safe down there. We're going to do the best up here. I hope we get to do good. this again. Absolutely. Now, while you're all staying home, make sure you go to Gold Derby, make your predictions, click subscribe and watch all of our great contender chats because, hey, we're at home, you might as well watch them.